Hey, Michael, good to see you. Uh, Monte has been posting encouraging updates on his Instagram about his return. Um, do you have an updated timeline on, on when you're expecting him potentially back? And how much was he able to participate in yesterday's team gathering or practice or whatever that was? Yeah, I mean, he's definitely getting closer. Uh, give Monte a lot of credit. He's been uh, working very hard with the training staff, uh, the strength and conditioning coaches trying to get back taking steps every day. Uh, I think once we get back from this LA trip, uh, the next few days will be important, kind of uh, see where his conditioning is at and how much he's able to, you know, uh, to push off and to run and, and, and really uh, test that hamstring. Um, so uh, he, he's still not ready to come back in the next couple of games, but he, he's definitely getting closer and closer and uh, he's making great progress. Brandon Crystal. Coach, how much does not knowing LeBron's status prior to earlier in the day change the way you guys approach the game? And then when you find out that he's going to uh, not be in there tonight, um, what, how and, and what does it change? Yeah, well, we approached it as if he was playing. Uh, much easier to prepare for LeBron uh, and then make the necessary changes upon him being out. Uh, and that's just the nature of this beast. You know, you can prepare for certain teams certain matchups, put together a game plan, then a guy or two may be out, and that changes things. But uh, I think the teams that are, are able to react to that um, quickly definitely have an advantage. So um, we weren't sure of his status. We weren't sure of Dennis Schroeder's status. We assumed both would play, and obviously now both are out. Um, but I think the other thing, too, Grant, is that we, we go into every game worrying about us. You prepare for your opponent. What do they do? Uh, what are the things that we have to try to take away? But we also have to stay true to ourselves. We're playing really good basketball, nine and one in our last 10, 17 and three in our last 20. Let's understand why we're having success, regardless of who we're playing. Mark Wicker. Michael, I think a lot of people from the outside would have assumed that, that you would have had to make some some fairly significant tweaks and adjustments when, when Jamal went down. But what was that process really like, especially in the beginning? Yeah, I think the biggest uh, challenge when Jamal went down to the, uh, the torn ACL was just reminding all of our players that our goals are unchanged. Um, will it be harder without a player of Jamal Murray's stature? Of course, he's our second best player. Um, I think the fact that uh, we have played as well as we have without Jamal is just another endorsement of Nikola Jokic's MVP candidacy uh, to put a team on his back to be a top 10 offense and defense without Jamal Murray. Uh, that has been really fun to watch. Um, and, and just reminding our guys as well, not one player was going to replace Jamal Murray and all he did for us. Uh, it was going to be by committee. And, and I think we've gotten that. Unfortunately, right after Jamal went down, you lose Monte Morris, you lose Will Barton, uh, but you have to give so much credit to Faku Campazzo, P.J. Dozier, Austin Rivers, Shaq Harrison, those four guards, a rookie, a guy who was a two-way last year, a 10-day contract, and another two-way. Those guys by committee did a hell of a job while Michael Porter and Nicola kind of solidified the scoring uh, and made the big baskets that we have needed in a lot of close games. Bill Goon. Hey, Michael. Um, what's it been like bringing in JaVale McGee to your locker room? Uh, and does it matter that he's a guy that you, you faced last year in the Western Conference Finals and, 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 uh, and, and he was on a team that beat you guys? Yeah, I mean, overall, it's, it's been a huge positive, uh, you know, for me. You know, anytime you can add a player that has won three world championships, um, you know, you, you're adding to your culture, a guy that's been around winning at the highest level, which JaVale has. Uh, I believe he's getting his world championship ring tonight, which is a tremendous honor. And it'll be great for all of our young players to kind of see that uh, because that's what we aspire to be as world champions. Um, it hasn't been easy for JaVale. You know, I'm not, I'm not naive. Uh, we have so many talented bigs, so many veteran bigs off the bench. You can't play everybody. Uh, both Jermichael Green and Paul Millsap have been playing at a very high level. So JaVale hasn't gotten a chance to play a ton for us. But 
Uh, when we traded for him, we knew that we were getting a guy that would be great for our culture. And when called upon, could go out there and help us win at a high level. Um, he started for a team that won the championship last year. So he brings rim protection. He's a dynamic roller on offense. And even when he's not playing, he's not allowed that to affect his leadership, uh, which has been really neat to see. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for JaVale, everything he's accomplished, and how helpful he's been for our team since joining the club. Ethan Fuller. Hey, Coach. Um, I know you shouted out P.J. Dozier on the last post game. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how his development and his game overall from a two-way player to now a starter for you guys. Um, what about his game has given you the confidence to put him in the starting role and with some of these tough defensive matchups that you've mentioned before? Yeah, you know, uh, even when he was just a two-way player for us, like uh, I, I don't look at guys based on your status, you know, what round you were drafted in. Are you a two-way player? If you look at my body of work in six years, I'll play anybody if I think you can help us win a game. And we've seen that from Monte Morris and Torrey Craig. P.J. Dozier is just another example of that. He was playing for us while he was a two-way player and helping us win games. Um, I think he made a huge jump last season in the playoffs down in Orlando. Uh, that first round, he showed that he could go out there and guard the likes of Jordan Clarkson and Mike Conley, which was really impactful in us winning that series. Um, you love the fact that he's as big and strong as he is. He's, his versatility offensively, the one, the two, the three, his ability to guard, play, make, rebound. And, and the, the big question has always been, can P.J. make enough threes to keep the defense honest? And, and he has this year. Um, you know, big fan of P.J. as a person, first and foremost. And I think he's proven every time he's given an opportunity to play and extend his role, uh, he's taken it and run with it. So uh, you have to be happy for a guy like P.J. Dozier because – Nothing's been handed to him. He has earned everything he's gotten. Hello, you Getty. Hey, Michael, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the playing game lately, and even though it's not going to directly affect you guys, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on it, whether it's something that the league should continue going forward. And, and maybe the fact that this season started so quickly, is that do you think that's credit con contributing to some of the maybe backlash? Because normally you would rest – more guys maybe during this period leading up to the playoffs for some teams? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a tough one. You know, uh, on one hand, you understand where the league is coming from. Uh, the playing tournament generates a tremendous amount of excitement, uh, more viewership, more fans. So this is a business first and foremost. So let's not forget that. Um, obviously, I think a lot of the teams that are looking at potentially being in the play-in aren't happy about it. Um, I know for me, um, hopefully we can avoid being in the playing tournament, but uh, I, I would say probably you know, not a huge fan of it. I, I like what they did last year, to be perfectly honest. I, I thought it was a conditional playing tournament. If you were within a certain range of games, okay, we're going to make you guys play for it. Uh, whereas this year, regardless, you could be up 10 games as a seven seed on the eight seed, but you have to play a game. And what happens if one of your best players is out at that time because of an injury? Um, and then being a coach, being a son of a coach, uh, you know, I think the playing tournament is not great for coaching because ultimately, you know, we're judged on wins and losses, making the playoffs, making a deep playoff run. And, and I don't know if the playing tournament is really conducive to uh, coaches and their, their, their job. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Again, like I said earlier, uh, the fans seem to love it. The viewership seems to love it, but I just wish there was, you have to be within a certain, uh, within a certain amount of games for that game to be played. If you're not within a certain number of games, you shouldn't penalize a team that's played really well for the large majority of the season. All right, coach, we got time for one more. We're going to end with Mike Singer. Hey, Michael. Boston, Miami, the Lakers have all obviously had roller coaster seasons. You, you guys have too. Um, how much does that set, the fact that you guys have stayed afloat, how much is that a testament to not just Nicola's production, but his attitude this entire season and coming in after the short off season? Yeah, I think it's tremendous. I mean, and, and, and I think, you know, the, the last four teams standing in Orlando have had ups and downs, injuries, COVID. Uh, and I have to believe, especially for the Lakers, I mean, they 
win a championship, you know, that, that is, and then you start two months later, that is a lot to ask for a team that was down in that bubble for a long time. Uh, and having been there for 83 days myself, you know, this year, this current season has felt like a very long season. It's been probably the most challenging season uh, in my very short NBA career. So um, Nicola being able to go home and not know when next season was going to start, that, that to me is the most remarkable thing about it. As coaches, as players, right, we deal in black and white. You know when training camp's going to start, when your preseason's going to start, and when your home opener is going to be. Well, when we came back from Orlando, no one knew anything. You heard different things, maybe middle of January, and ultimately they decided on December 1st for training camp. But the fact that Nicola, not knowing when we were going to start, he never came up for air, man. He just stayed, stayed with it, came back in even better shape than he was in came back in mentally engaged, ready to go. He did not need a month to warm up and kind of ease into the season. He attacked the season from game one. And I think that's probably the most remarkable thing about this season, not just how well he's played, but the availability, the durability, and just the, the toughness for him to do what he's done. It's, uh, I think it's extraordinary. All right, that'll do it. Thank you. Thank you.